Evans, welcome to Ramacro. In today's video, I'll be giving my thoughts on the November 2022 JW broadcasting episode, which was hosted by governing body helper William Turner. Now, as always, there's a lot to get through, so without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Please follow along as I read Psalm 106, verses 7 and 8. Our forefathers in Egypt did not appreciate your wonderful works. They did not remember your abundant loyal love. But they rebelled at the sea, by the Red Sea. But he saved them for the sake of his name, to make his mightiness known. And what was the result? Let's read verse 13. But they quickly forgot what he did. They did not wait. For his counsel. How sad. The people did not wait. They were not patient. And that highlights that they did not appreciate Jehovah's patience and loyal love. Love for God should have caused them to think about the consequences of their actions. They should have remembered how Jehovah cared and provided for them. That should have moved them to be patient and wait on Jehovah's direction. But time and again, their actions show that they really didn't love Jehovah as they should have, and it cost them. They eventually tested Jehovah's patience to the limit, and as a nation, lost his favor. What can you and I learn from their example? Never would we want to become independent of Jehovah, trusting in our own thinking, and not patiently waiting for Jehovah's counsel to direct the decisions we make. Think about how well we've been guided recently regarding the pandemic, natural disasters, and the organizing of our ministry. Even if we didn't fully understand or even fully agree with all the decisions, our love for God helped us to take the time to think about Jehovah's care for us and trust Him. By doing so, we learn that if we're patient and submit to Jehovah's direction, we won't go off course and we'll benefit ourselves and others. And in doing so, we ultimately express our love for Jehovah. We've just been listening to the opening remarks of William Turner in the November 2022 broadcast. He's supposed to be talking about patience and about the quality of patience and how Jehovah's Witnesses are to cultivate this quality. But it doesn't take long for him to use this opportunity to talk about the need for Jehovah's Witnesses to be obedient. Never would we want to become independent of Jehovah, trusting in our own thinking and not patiently waiting for Jehovah's counsel to direct the decisions we make. So it's not really about patience, is it? It's about being dependent on the organization or not independent of the organization and waiting on Jehovah's direction. This is all about control. This is an organization that wants to be able to micromanage its followers in the most intimate areas of their lives. I just struggle to understand why they need to start the conversation as being about patience, but then take it in all of these weird directions. If you're going to talk about patience and the need for patience and situations in which we might require patience and how difficult it can be, fine, do a talk about that. I started watching this month's broadcast assuming there would be practically nothing to talk about. Patience is something that we all struggle with from time to time. And any number of religions or religious leaders will have something to say on it. But they just have to go there, don't they? They just have to use almost any theme. It could be a theme about 
the need for compassion or the need for resilience or the need for showing positivity towards others. Almost any subject, apparently, can be twisted into an opportunity for the organisation to exert its control. And for me, one of the most chilling parts of William Turner's monologue was when he said this. Even if we didn't fully understand or even fully agree with all the decisions, our love for God helped us to take the time to think about Jehovah's care for us and trust him. You may not understand a decision. You may not agree with a decision. But you've got to fall in line with it anyway. You've just got to trust that the organization knows better than you. This, for me, was evocative of the advice given in the 2013 November 15th Watchtower on page 20. They just seem to keep echoing this rhetoric throughout their literature and throughout their video propaganda. At that time, the life-saving direction that we receive from Jehovah's Organization may not appear practical from a human standpoint. All of us must be ready to obey any instructions we may receive, whether these appear sound from a strategic or human standpoint or not. That's the extent of the control that this organization expects and in fact wields when it comes to the millions who follow Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not about whether you understand it. It's not about whether you agree with it. It's not about whether it appears sound from a strategic or human standpoint. It doesn't have to make sense to you. If you're told to do something, you should do it. And as I've said repeatedly, that sort of thinking takes you straight to Jonestown. If you follow it to its fullest extent, what's to stop an organization from telling all of its followers, hey, you need to drink this pill? It may not seem like a good idea, may seem a bit crazy, may seem like it doesn't make sense, but you should trust it, shouldn't you? So take the pill. So again, it seems there can be no such thing as just an ordinary, boring JW Broadcasting episode that isn't remotely culty. Apparently that's impossible. Even when they're talking about patience and the need for patience, they need to bring in this rhetoric about control and how much control they expect. And the selling points, if you were paying attention to being a Jehovah's Witness were, look at the advice we gave out during the pandemic. Look at how we deal with natural disasters. And thirdly, look at how our ministry is organized. Well, the third one, organizing your ministry, recruiting other people into the group, that's self-serving, isn't it? <laughs> An organization that's good at recruiting is an organization that's good at pursuing its own agenda, isn't it? The first two, dealing with the pandemic and dealing with natural disasters. So we're supposed to be unable to navigate those problems if we're not Jehovah's Witnesses. That's self-evidently not the case. There were Jehovah's Witnesses who died during the pandemic and continue to die because the pandemic is ongoing, of course. Jehovah's Witnesses died and non-Jehovah's Witnesses died. There was nothing remarkable in the way Jehovah's Witnesses responded to the pandemic. They just did what was expected. They just followed the guidance that they were given by the authorities. That's not a remarkable thing. 
And it's the same thing with natural disasters. Jehovah's Witnesses say, when there's a natural disaster, you should follow the advice that's given to you by the authorities. Well, that's the situation everyone's in. So I don't understand the selling points that William Turner is giving. I'm sure Jehovah's Witnesses will be nodding along and profoundly impressed with these selling points, with these reminders of how amazing their organization is. But when it all boils down to it, when you really just stand back and look at not just the organization, but the rhetoric that's coming out of the organization and the expectations regarding control, it's not just a man-made organization. It's not just completely unremarkable and void of any evidence of divine inspiration. It's also, when you think about it, a profoundly toxic and harmful organization to be involved in. Let's start with the greatest example, Jehovah. Think about the patience he's shown in waiting to bring an end to this system. Jehovah has a fixed day and hour when that will take place, and he's patiently waiting until that arrives. He's bound himself to his own timetable. Now, rest assured, Jehovah is well aware of how we feel as his servants. He knows that we wish the end of this system to come as soon as possible, and that we long to see the fulfillment of all his promises, and he longs to fulfill them. But he will not become impatient and act before his appointed time. Why should we appreciate Jehovah's patience in that regard? Please follow along as I read 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Furthermore, consider the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote you according to the wisdom given him. Isn't that a powerful point? Jehovah's patience is the means for our salvation. Think about the number of people who are learning the truth every year. Even during the pandemic, when we weren't able to engage in our typical house-to-house -house witnessing, tens of thousands of individuals still got baptized worldwide. Perhaps some of those included your Bible students, family members, close friends, or maybe even you yourself. And think about this. If Jehovah had impatiently brought the end of this system five, ten, or twenty years ago, would you have learned the truth? So we appreciate that Jehovah is still patiently waiting for his day to arrive and has allowed so many to attain to repentance and develop a relationship with him. Wow, I'm so glad. William Turner just said all that because that's the sort of stuff you would typically hear on a Kingdom Hall platform. It's the sort of fob off that elders on the Kingdom Hall platform would usually give the congregation when talking about how painful it is to wait year after year, decade after decade, with no Armageddon. So... <laughs> As a Jehovah's Witness, it's kind of the elephant in the room that for years or decades you've been preaching the end and it's still not here. William Turner has apparently assigned himself or been assigned the theme patience or that's what his talk is supposed to be on, the subject of patience. He's already used this as an opportunity to remind Jehovah's Witnesses of the level of control that's expected of them. He's now using this theme of patience to give this excuse as to why Armageddon has been so long in coming. He points to 2 Peter 3 verse 15, consider the patience of our Lord as salvation. And he effectively says, well, if you think about it, if God had brought Armageddon 
before you were baptized, then you would have died. <laughs> That's essentially his reasoning here. He is appealing to individual hubris and greed and the desire for self-preservation. That's what he is appealing to here. That's what this organization is willing to sink to. Oh, well, you know, it's worked out well for you, hasn't it? <laughs> That's what we're talking about. In actual fact, this logic unravels with minimal scrutiny. So we're supposed to believe that as the years tick by, rather than Armageddon being late, this is just Jehovah being really, really patient in allowing more and more people to become Jehovah's Witnesses and therefore get saved. That makes sense until you think about the global population and how it's increasing at a ridiculous rate. As I make this video, the population has just ticked over. There is like a clock somewhere online that estimates the global population, and it's recently, as in the last few days, ticked over to 8 billion people estimated to be alive on Earth now. 8 billion people on our planet. William Turner gives this reasoning regarding the patience of Jehovah. If Jehovah had impatiently brought the end of this system, five, 10, or 20 years ago. Would you have learned the truth? So let's have some fun here. Let's take those spans of time that William Turner has just given us hypothetically. Five years ago was 2017, when the global population was 7.6 billion. 10 years ago, the global population in 2012 was 7.06 billion. So nearly a billion increase over the last 10 years. 2002, the global population was 6.2 billion. So 20 years ago in 2002, 6.2 billion. So over the last 20 years, the number of human beings on our planet has increased by 1.8 billion. And Jehovah's Witnesses are baptizing people at a rate of around about 200 to 300,000 per year. <sighs> Maybe it's just my maths. But I don't see any extraordinary example of patience. Rather, I see that as the years tick by, the global population is hurtling upwards at a ridiculous rate. In fact, it's increasing by 67 million per year. Jehovah's Witnesses only have eight and a half million and our earth is producing more human beings per year at a rate of 67 million. That's apparently patience. Jehovah is allowing 67 million extra people once births and deaths have been accounted for at the end of each year 67 million people he can kill. That's apparently him being patient. If you go back to 1914, because let's remember, we're supposedly in the last days, and the last days began, apparently, in 1914. Revelation refers to the last days as a short period of time when Satan is cast down to the earth. I'll let you decide whether it really has been a short period of time 
in the, what was it, 108 years since Satan has been cast down. But what was the global population in 1914 between 1.7 and 1.8 billion? So all through the last days, Jehovah, a God of love, a God of patience, we're learning, has been allowing the Earth's population to swell by more than 6 billion so that he can demonstrate his patience in allowing enough time for only 8.5 million to become Jehovah's Witnesses and survive Armageddon. To give Jehovah their best, some of our brothers give up lucrative and prestigious careers. Making this decision may take time and patience, as we'll see in our first video. I played in the Series A, which is the top league in Italy. I was on the national youth team, and I went all the way up to the men's national team. Just the fact that you are good at your job is gratifying. And then there is also the financial aspect. My mom and dad were Jehovah's Witnesses, and so was my older brother. At a certain point, I felt conflicted. Especially when I decided to draw closer to the truth. It was no longer a family thing. In time, something started to develop in me. A fire, a small fire. Gradually, I came to the point of dedication to Jehovah, although I still played. But maybe, not maybe, definitely, I wasn't giving Jehovah my best, my energy. I was fitting my spiritual life around my work life and not the other way around. I excused myself saying, I'm just working, it's a profession. Yes, it's time consuming, but of short duration because athletes retire earlier. I started in 1995 and continued until April 2008, when I played my last match. I, let's say, made a cut and quit playing basketball. I'm glad I made it. Sometimes I say to myself, if only you had done it earlier, if only you had had the courage earlier. Sam Wele said he'd wished he had given up basketball earlier to pursue spiritual goals. From that we learned that decisions to spend time on personal interest take away from time we should give to Jehovah. The sooner we appreciate Jehovah's patience, the sooner we enjoy the blessings which make us truly rich. We're happy that Jehovah exercised patience with Brother Podesta and helped him to regain his balance. If you're facing a career decision, be assured that when we focus first on serving Jehovah and teaching others His Word, we're happier. I found this testimony in the November 2022 JW Broadcasting episode infuriating. The only thing I'm glad about is that it's not about football. Usually, when they drag someone on camera to talk about how brilliant it is that they spurned a career in sports or didn't fulfill their potential, they put the organization first. Usually, if it's sports related, it's about football or soccer, as Americans tend to call it. I'm really, really glad that just for once they're doing this about a different sport. This time it's basketball. But apart from that, it's exactly the same narrative. Someone gives up their potential as an athlete, or as, frankly, 
someone who's famous, because that's what this is about, in favor of an organization that needs its followers to live unremarkable lives. That's all this is about. Because the guy was a professional basketball player. That's a profession. That's a job. And by the way, it was his job for 14 years. So from 1995 to 2008, he had a 14-year career as a basketball player. He quit, more or less, when his career was winding down anyway. But all that aside, what was the problem with him being a professional basketball player? He may have enjoyed basketball as well. It's okay to do something that you like and be paid for it. I'm sure most of us would agree that that's in fact kind of what you should aim for. <laughs> There's no shame in actually enjoying the thing that people are paying you money to do. In this case, it's basketball. But the problem was... Not that this conflicted with his worship, although that's what we're expected to swallow. The problem was the fame and the prestige. And oh no, someone might have a name for themselves. Someone might be well known who isn't a governing body member. They're the only ones who get to be famous, who get to have some prestige, apparently. Tony Morris, David Splain, Stephen Lett. Those are the men who get to be prestigious. To some degree, William Turner and the rest of the governing body helpers. But if you're a rank and file member, you'd better not be famous. I actually think this is one area in which the Mormons show a little bit more reasonableness. And I'm speaking as someone who's never been an LDS church member although I did briefly study with them. But I find it interesting that you can be a Mormon and you can, for example, be in a rock band because Brandon Flowers from The Killers, he is Mormon. And he hasn't been, to my knowledge, excommunicated or anything. So that's one area of a few, I would suggest, in which the LDS church shows itself to be at least a little bit more reasonable. But with Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't just demand control over you in terms of micromanaging your life. They insist on you making it impossible for yourself to basically get any sort of fame or recognition. That sort of thing is reserved only for the governing body. When we see how others are handling situations, we may not be as patient as we'd like to be. That's what happens to Nita and Jade in the following dramatization. How do they learn to be more patient with each other? You're late. Mm -hmm. I said you're late. Sorry. You work here now? Yeah, just a, just a few weeks. 
You look great. Um, what can I get you? I tried texting, you know, after you ended it. Chai latte. That was your favourite. Jade, you were my favourite. Ollie, you know why I had to... I know. I know, but I want to study your religion. Yeah, that's what I texted. Well, I got a new phone and I didn't, I didn't see them. <laughs> okay, but how about I leave you my number and we can meet up. Come on. And that's when you walked away. Tell me you walked away. Ooh, it looks like Nita isn't happy with Jade's encounter with her ex. Wonder why that is. Anyway, we're watching the latest instalment in the Jade and Nita saga. This has the theme, Cultivate Patience. But as we're going to see, the story that's unfolding has very little to do with patience. It's actually more to do with Jade's love life, quite frankly, and the extent to which the Jehovah's Witness religion gets a say in it. That's ultimately what this is about. It's another perfect example of Jehovah's Witnesses giving you a theme and then working in all sorts of sub-themes that are really the main theme. In other words, what you have is a hidden message. They're asking you to trust them that it's just like a positive upbuilding video about how brilliant patience is, when really this has nothing to do with cultivating patience and everything to do with cultivating subservience and sexual repression. Tell me you walked away. He gave me his number. What? No. Jade. He said he wants to study. Yeah, he wants to study you. We can't read hearts. I think I can read yours. <laughs> he was sweet. And if he wants to know the truth... I... I can't even believe this. What does it say? It says low battery. No. What the... This, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not become unevenly yoked with unbelievers. There was no yoking. I haven't yoked. But this opens the door to the yoke. I'm not stupid. You act like I don't know this. No, you act like you don't know this. That's a lot of backstory. You asked what happened. I thought you're like, you know, Sum up in a word or something. <laughs> anyway, now you know. So, are you going to call him then? I don't think so. Why not? Because I don't think it's religion that he's interested in. I could have told you that. Well, I think this particular episode may just have saved the entire Jade and Nita franchise. What we had was these two characters brought back from being used in a series of convention dramatizations, brought back so that they could more thoroughly show Jehovah's Witnesses 
how to indoctrinate others and retain their own indoctrination. That's what ultimately all this is about. It's utterly infuriating from that perspective, but at least this particular episode has given us this amazing piece of dialogue. I haven't yoked, but this opens the door to the yoke. There was no yoking. I haven't yoked, but this opens the door to the yoke. <laughs> wow, that blew my mind. That is some epic writing. Pats on the back all round. JW.org writing department. But <laughs> jokes aside, when they're talking about yoking, obviously it has nothing to do with egg yolks. <laughs> This is all to do with the yoke as in agriculture and cattle and putting a yoke on bulls or horses or whatever. This is to do with being tied down in a relationship. Do not become unevenly yoked with unbelievers is a verse that Jehovah's Witnesses use to further the culture of sexual repression. It's one of many areas in which young Jehovah's Witnesses have their private lives policed and controlled and manipulated and molded to the point where it affects them on a deep and profound level. Jade hasn't grown up with this. She has inexplicably signed up to it, albeit through a process that involved no small amount of deception. She signed up to the Jehovah's Witness belief system with all of its bells and whistles, with all of its control and all of its manipulation, and a huge part of being a Jehovah's Witness is having your love life controlled so that you don't get to make certain basic decisions about who you get into relationships with. You're obviously not allowed to get into gay relationships. You're not allowed to be gay or homosexual or bisexual. You have to be straight, or at least pretend to be straight. You're not allowed to have sex outside of marriage, regardless of whether you're having sex with a consenting adult. It has to be someone that you're married to. And it also, as we're seeing here, has to be a fellow believer, has to be a Jehovah's Witness. I wonder if Nita explained that to Jade in her first few attempts at recruiting her into the organization. Would you like to join our organization, Jade, which polices your love life, tells you who you are allowed to love and not love, tells you whether you can be gay or straight, and tells you that you can only be in a relationship with fellow Jehovah's Witnesses. I wonder if that was part of the sales pitch. Somehow, I doubt it. I made you a cup. Thanks, you're amazing. Listen, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I know I came on strong. No, you were right. But I could have been more patient. I reacted too quickly. I know you know what the right thing to do is. I should have given you more time to talk it out. I called Brother Davies and gave him the background and said if he's really interested, he'll have a study. Then I deleted Ollie's number. 
I knew it. I knew you'd do the right thing. Well, sometimes. But I should have been more patient. And I should have heard you out. It's just not what I wanted to hear in the moment. So we're good? Always. No more apologizing till I finish this coffee. It's too painful. <laughs> mm. It's so nice. Haven't we enjoyed the journey of Nita and Jade? From when they first appeared in our convention videos up to these latest episodes, they've encountered situations we can all relate to. Jade, progressing from Bible student to Bible teacher, learning to reject falsehoods about Jehovah's people, and refining qualities like patience. Nita has grown as a disciple maker and as a caring spiritual sister. The encouraging lesson for us? Keep growing as a spiritual person. And when he says keep growing as a spiritual person, I think what he means is keep allowing yourself to be controlled in every aspect of your life. That's, again, what this installment of the Jade and Nita saga has been all about. I'm not completely sure, by the way, what that little piece there from William Turner about how appreciative everyone should be regarding the Jade and Nita series. I'm not completely sure what it was all about. It was almost as though it was a farewell. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Part of me hopes that they continue the series because it just makes the control and the manipulation so blatant and so out there for all to see. But the way he spoke in the past tense, haven't we enjoyed, just seemed to indicate to me that maybe this might have been the last installment or the episodes may be winding down. Who knows? I guess we'll see in future JW Broadcasting episodes. But what a rich, fertile episode this has been in terms of, again, examples of control. Let's remember, this is all supposed to be about patience, indeed cultivating patience. But the script writers clearly had a different agenda when they weren't coming up with hilarious lines about yoking or being yoked they were coming up with a plot that very clearly reminded Jehovah's Witnesses who's in charge when it comes to people's love life. Ultimately, the religion gets to decide who you pursue a relationship or don't pursue a relationship with. But the writers clearly had to at least pretend that it was about patience or pay lip service to the concept of patience, which they did here. But I could have been more patient. I reacted too quickly. I know you know what the right thing to do is. I should have given you more time to talk it out. I know you know what the right thing to do is. I should have given you more time to talk it out. So there was absolutely nothing wrong with what Nita said. It's just the timing that was off. She just said it too quickly. She was impatient in giving sound advice to Jade about what she should do with her love life. Isn't that interesting? They've somehow managed to make this about patience when really it's about something very, very different. And if you think about it, extremely chilling. And I really hope some of you watching this are watching it as people who've never been Jehovah's Witnesses before. You're just having a look through the shop window. 
You just fancy seeing what this goofy religion is all about. These people who bother you on a Saturday morning when you're enjoying your cornflakes, you get that knock on the door, you either ignore it and carry on eating your cornflakes or you tell them to get lost. But deep down, maybe you're thinking, well, maybe there's something to this. I hope you're watching because this is what this organization is all about. Nita was right, apparently, to manipulate Jade, to scorn her for even entertaining the thought of getting back with her ex. She was right to do that. It's just the timing that was wrong. The right thing was to delete Ollie's number. And let's remember, when Ollie first approaches Jade in the coffee shop, he alludes to Jade being the one who ended their relationship. As I recall, back in the convention dramatizations, when we first meet Jade, you see her, I think, on the underground with Ollie. And then we learn in this latest episode that Jade ended her relationship with her boyfriend after encountering and starting a study with Jehovah's Witnesses. And then when Jade's talking to Ollie in the coffee shop and Ollie expresses this desire to start studying, Jade says, well, I got a new phone. So let's put the pieces together, shall we? This organization, if you start studying and you're in a relationship with someone who is not a believer, this is an organization where you might be required to break off your relationship. You might be required to get a new phone so that people from your social circle can't reach out to you. You're blocking yourself off from your loved ones who know you and who might be concerned that you're getting into a cult. And the ones who do have the number to your new phone are your new friends who are conditionally friends with you, conditionally based on your continued interest and involvement with their religion. And then, if your ex happens to turn up at some future point, even if he says something like, I'm interested in joining your religion, the default position must be that you are suspicious and that if your ex gives you their number, you are supposed to delete it. That's the right thing to do. That's the level of control. Thank you, whoever wrote this, not just for the silly line about yoking, but for making it so clear, so crystal clear, that this organization expects to be involved in every step, every decision people take regarding their love lives. My two younger brothers were still in elementary school. So I woke up early, did the milk rounds, worked in a factory during the day and went to school at night. My life was super busy then. My life became significantly easier after marriage. Since my wife did the housework, all I needed to do was work. Before, I was so busy that I never really got to have any fun. One day, a friend took me to a betting shop for horse racing. And to my surprise, I got lucky. I was surprised that you can buy a ticket and then you get all this money in your hands. So that's how it started. It gradually became worse, to the point that I would get off the night shift and go straight to the races. I loved gambling more than eating and sleeping. 
On my way home, images of my wife and children would come to my mind. And I had this nagging feeling that I really should be getting my life together. When I was broke, I would go to the pawn shops. I pawned our camera and even my wife's jewellery. My wife started studying the Bible. And to try and make my wife and children a little happy, I also agreed to a study. Before I started gambling, I liked growing vegetables. You know, everything a vegetable needs, all the instructions to grow, is in this tiny seed that is one or two millimeters in size. I knew that couldn't just happen by chance. I was convinced that there must be a God. Through my Bible study, I learned that this God is Jehovah, and that made me really happy. I found you. That's how I felt. However, it was really difficult to quit gambling. You know, many times I wanted to quit, and I would pay back my loans, but then take out some more again. My wife's relative said to me, only death can cure you. We're watching the testimony of a gentleman named Takei. This is from the November 2022 JW Broadcasting episode. It's a familiar trope. This same old story that gets regurgitated time and time again, where someone goes from leading some kind of debauched or errant lifestyle and then they become a Jehovah's Witness, and then everything magically gets better, or they feel that they have improved in some way or been able to get rid of this undesirable aspect of their lives. That's what we're dealing with again, I'm afraid. I did just want to zero in on two really interesting clips from this particular story, the first being this one. My life became significantly easier after marriage. Since my wife did the housework, all I needed to do was work. Was that really necessary? In order to tell Takei's story, did we really need to hear that part of the story and even have that part of the story reenacted? Let's remember how these testimonies are put together. It's not like Takei has sat down in front of the camera and every single word he has said about his life is now being played back for us. Typically what you would do is you would edit his story so that the most relevant parts are portrayed or are shown on camera. He may have been talking for an hour, two hours, three hours, who knows? It certainly wasn't just a few minutes, which is what it's been edited down to. And for some reason, the writers or the makers of JW Broadcasting have decided that this particular thing about his marriage making his life easier because his wife did all the housework, for some reason they've decided that that needs to make the cut and be reenacted. So I guess I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but to my eye, or from my perspective, this seems like more evidence that ultimately we're dealing with an extremely sexist patriarchal organization that still got its mind somewhere in the 1950s, where women are the housekeepers and men are the earners. Then we have Takei giving this slam dunk argument for the existence of God. You know, everything a vegetable needs, all the instructions to grow, is in this tiny seed that is one or two millimeters in size. I knew that couldn't just happen by chance. Wow. Well, when you put it like that, Takei, <laughs> I'm completely flawed. I have no answer, neither do any scientists have any answer for that logic. 
honestly, it's not, again, I've said this repeatedly, but maybe someone else needs to hear this. Evolution by natural selection is not blind chance. It has the illusion or the appearance of chance because it isn't being directed by any known intelligence, but it's very much cause and effect. So when it comes to the way seeds have evolved, they have evolved in a particular way so that a plant can grow and shed more seeds before it withers and dies. That's how natural selection works. The size, quite frankly, is irrelevant. Two millimeters to take is vast, is a huge boulder to an ant. <laughs> and it's even bigger if you're a microbe or a bacterium. You know, what's the size got to do with anything? According to Takei, if you can make something small and relatively complex compared to, say, a pumpkin <laughs> or a house, if it can be squashed down to a size that Takei considers very, very small, then it's suitably complicated for it to no longer be attributable to natural selection or to, as he puts it, chance. I'm sorry, I don't find that convincing. And I would submit that perhaps Takei needs to study evolution a little bit more and understand how it works before he gives us such rubbish arguments against it. I attended a circuit assembly for the first time. Put away the old personality and put on the new personality. As I was reading those words from the Bible, I felt that was about me. When I asked myself, hey, what's happening to my life right now? I saw how horrible and ugly my mindset was. I felt tears well up. I knew this was Jehovah talking to me and I felt determined to do something about it. I couldn't do it on my own. So I prayed to Jehovah from the bottom of my heart, saying, I really want to stop, no matter what. I want to hate gambling and not just avoid it. Please give me this feeling of hate. I prayed like this every day. Since then, I have felt zero desire to gamble. Good for you, Take. I'm glad to hear that. You seem like a genuinely nice guy. Gambling is a horrible cycle to get stuck in. It's a, a terrible way of draining your resources, your family's resources, and leading you to depression and mental health issues. And so for you to break free from gambling is genuinely fantastic. And I'm thrilled for you. I just think you could have done it without joining a cult. And I think lots of people are able to break free from all manner of addictions without doing so with the help of groups like Jehovah's Witnesses. All that's effectively happening is one dependency is being replaced with another. That's what's happened here. He was dependent previously on gambling for his highs and for his feelings of self-worth. And he learned through a process of indoctrination to switch it so that he instead got those highs and those feelings of self-worth from a from an organization from as it turns out quite a harmful abusive apocalyptic organization so are there more healthy ways to stop gambling definitely 
and I wish you had pursued those ways instead. But I guess whatever gets you through the week, Take, um, I'm not in a position to know to what extent the Jehovah's Witness organization is negatively impacting Take's life. It's certainly stripping him of critical thinking skills, as we saw with his arguments against evolution, it's certainly a group that seeks to control Take and micromanage his decisions that he makes in his everyday life. But is it worth it in order to not be constantly in debt and dealing with gambling addiction? I don't know. That's for him to decide. But for everyone else who's watching, let me be blunt. This is not how you get over gambling. This is not how you get over any addiction. And if you needed any proof, here it is. Put away the old personality and put on the new personality. As I was reading those words from the Bible, I felt that was about me. Put away the old personality and put on the new personality. Become a different person person. That's what you need to do when you join Jehovah's Witnesses. Because before you join Jehovah's Witnesses, there's something wrong with who you are as a person. And now Take has joined Jehovah's Witnesses, not only is he free from the desire to gamble to the point where he said he hates gambling, He's also got a little bit of baggage in the form of a devotion to eight dudes in New York who he believes are a channel between God and mankind who he believes have the right to control his life. Quite a bit of baggage there, isn't it? Really, is it healthy for any organization to insist that you change who you are as a person? Not just in terms of getting rid of undesirable dependencies such as gambling or alcoholism or being addicted to nicotine, you name it, drugs, whatever, but in other areas, areas that benefit the organization. Areas that give the organization power over you. This, again, is just the same old trope, I'm afraid, that we've seen repeated time and time again. Yes, there are things in life that people can get involved in that are inadvisable, that would do them harm. And it just so happens that Jehovah's Witnesses are one of many religions that frown on many of those things. But you should never, ever look to Jehovah's Witnesses as the cure. This is an organization that will always be more interested in controlling you than curing you. Now, as our comment points out, for much of his reign, Solomon did a lot of good things. But is it possible that right from the beginning, as involved as Solomon was in theocratic projects, there was a little red flag that something wasn't quite right? It's possible. Now, as our comment points out, when Solomon became king, he was a young man, but he was a young married man. In fact, when he became king, Solomon had probably been married for a couple of years already. He had a little boy. He was a daddy. He had a little boy, one-year-old, Rehoboam. But who was his wife? Probably his first wife. She was an Ammonitess. Ammonitess. What do we remember about Ammonitess? Oh, yes. Deuteronomy chapter 23. And verse 3. Now remember, when Solomon gets married, King David is still alive. David is probably at the wedding. Now here's what Deuteronomy 23.3 says. No Ammonite 
or Moabite may come into the congregation of Jehovah. Even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants may ever come into the congregation of Jehovah. What part of never did Solomon not understand? And so, could that mean that even before he became king, Solomon had a casual view of uh, Jehovah's laws on marriage? It's possible. Well, why do we say possible? Well, without being dogmatic, Insight says that there may have been exceptions for foreign women like Ruth the Moabitess. But Insight also says that Solomon's Ammonite wife possibly contributed to his apostasy. In any event, why was the first wife a foreign woman and an Ammonitess to boot? Now, if Solomon had married a nice Jewish girl, just one, and rejoiced uh, with the light, a wife of his youth, don't you think that the history of Israel would have been much different? I think it would have been. Wow. <laughs> Where do we even begin? So we've just been watching governing body member David Splain. He's making a cameo in the November 2022 JW Broadcasting episode, and in so doing, giving yet more evidence that there is no conspicuous knowledge or wisdom in this man. I mean, how are we supposed to look upon David Splain and on this performance by him and think, yes, I can see that of everyone alive on earth today, he needs to be among the top eight individuals who get to speak for God. If I were God... And I had 8 billion people at my disposal as possible conduits of my wisdom. I'd choose this chap <laughs> to get a good slice of the action. I, I, I'm sorry, I just, I don't see it. And I'm afraid it's going to get worse. He has more to say, which I will come to in this rebuttal. Let's start off with this gem. No Ammonite or Moabite may come into the congregation of Jehovah. Even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants may ever come into the congregation of Jehovah. What part of never did Solomon not understand? David Splain not holding back there. He's giving Solomon a real roasting <laughs> over his choice of first wife. Naamah, who was an Ammonitess. How dare she be an Ammonitess? What did she think she was doing? And what did Solomon think he was doing marrying her? What a rookie mistake to make. And truly a red flag. This is what David Splain's doing here. He's pointing out the red flags, the telltale signs that something was wrong with Solomon. He was a bit of a badden, and it, it should have been obvious right from the get-go with his choice of bride. And in order to school Solomon, who is long dead, if he even existed, which I'll come to, in order to lay down the law with Solomon, David Splain wheels out Deuteronomy 23 verse 3, which is a really interesting verse, but not quite for the reasons that David Splain would have you believe. So Deuteronomy 23 verse 3, no Ammonite or Moabite may come into the congregation of Jehovah. So straight away, there's a bit of racism there. <laughs> You're not allowed to follow the one and only true religion on earth at that time, if you are of a certain tribe, or specifically if you're not of a certain tribe. If you're born as an Ammonite or a Moabite, hard luck, you deserve to die. Or you don't deserve any special favour you don't deserve to have a relationship with God. God doesn't want to know you. 
that for me seems a little bit draconian doesn't even do it justice it's brutal it's discriminatory but let's carry on even to the 10th generation none of their descendants may ever come into the congregation of jehovah even to the 10th generation <laughs> i checked this this means that if you had an Ammonite or a Moabite in your lineage, if an Ammonite or a Moabite were your great, 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 great grandfather or grandmother, you don't get to be an Israelite. You don't get to be a follower of Judaism according to this. How does that make any sense? I mean, it, it, it's one thing to discriminate against people of a certain tribe, but to do it to this extent, it's not just cruel, it's just silly. It's, it's playground stuff, really, if you think about it. Anyway... David Splain wheels out this scripture in Deuteronomy 23 and says, What part of never did Solomon not understand? As though Solomon had Deuteronomy at his fingertips when he was deciding who should be his first wife, when he was deciding whether to get into a relationship with the Ammonites called Naamah, there's just one small problem, David Splain, who wants us all to think that he is some kind of Bible authority. Deuteronomy hadn't been written then. <laughs> it really infuriates me, viewers, when this man, who is so clearly ignorant about Bible scholarship, parades around and makes these assertions, even to the point of saying, what part of never didn't he understand? And in doing so, betrays just how little he knows about the Bible. He clearly cannot be bothered to learn the basics. I mean, the basics about when the Bible was written. In his mind, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, including Deuteronomy, those books were literally written by Moses in the wilderness, even though one of them describes the death of Moses. <laughs> These books were written by Moses in the wilderness. That's not what scholars say, though. If you go on the Wikipedia page, dating the Bible, it tells us that Deuteronomy began to be written, began to be written in the monarchic period between 745 and 586 BCE. Let that sink in. 745 to 586 BCE is the period, the monarchic period, in which Deuteronomy began to be written and the first few writings of Deuteronomy were written in the reign of Josiah. That's Deuteronomy chapters 5 through 26, which would have included Deuteronomy 23 and the ranting about Ammonites and Moabites. There's even the clue, really, when we learn more about the reign of Josiah and they conveniently find <laughs> the book of Moses when they're doing temple renovations, scholars have put two and two together and figured out that they didn't find it, they wrote it. So the question then is, when did Solomon reign? Well, according to the organization's publications, All Scriptures Inspired and Beneficial, which gives you a timeline. 
Solomon succeeded David in 1037 BCE and was succeeded by Rehoboam in 997 BCE. So David's plane is here holding Solomon to rules that were written a minimum of 250 years after he'd finished reigning. And that's just the basic housekeeping out of the way. We now need to talk about when David Splain said this. Why was the first wife a foreign woman and an Anamitess to boot? Now, if Solomon had married a nice Jewish girl, just one, and rejoiced uh, with the light, a wife of his youth, don't you think that the history of Israel would have been much different? I'm sure it would have been different, David, which I will come to. But what utter twaddle. Seriously, if you're watching this as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, how do you defend this? A nice Jewish girl. That's who Solomon should have married. Nice Jewish girl. Solomon was a Jew, so he should have married a nice Jewish girl. Is it just me, or is there some casual anti-Semitism there? I realise that it's not overtly anti-Semitic. He does, after all, use the word nice. But for me, that's very patronising language, and it's certainly promoting segregation. David Splain doesn't like the idea of foreign women. He doesn't like the idea of interracial marriages. That's what it sounds like to me. And David Splain has form in this sort of talk. Because if Tibor is gracious, you will see a thumbnail to a previous sushi. Is David Splain a bit anti-Semitic? That was sushi number 69. He has a history, a recent history, of saying odd things about the Jewish people on camera. And again, although I wouldn't file this under overtly anti-Semitic, it's certainly an odd thing to be saying about the Jewish people. Again, it's tantamount to saying, stay in your lane. You know, don't mix your blood with other races Solomon, as a Jew, he should have found himself a nice Jewish girl. This is the sort of language that we're getting from the faithful and discreet slave in the 21st century. <laughs> this is language that probably wouldn't have sounded remotely strange back in the years of Charles Taze Russell or Joseph Rutherford. But get with the programme, will you, David? This is, frankly, the language of a dinosaur. You know, this is an individual who has a very, very blinkered view regarding race and ethnicity and seems to think that everyone should just stay with their assigned races. That's at least where he's coming from in his condemnation of Solomon, and then when he says, how would the history have ended up? Don't you think that the history of Israel would have been much different? Yes, it would have been different, David. In fact, it would have been so different that it, Jesus wouldn't have been born. <laughs> it's, he's just so incompetent. It's not just that he doesn't know basic Bible scholarship about when certain books of the Bible were written, even if you take the Bible at face value, he doesn't know his Bible. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness, I can't believe I need to do this. <laughs> if you're a Jehovah's Witness, please turn to Matthew chapter 1, which gives us the lineage of Jesus. So 
Verse 1 says, The book of the history of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. If you go down to verse 7, it says, Solomon became father to Rehoboam. Rehoboam became father to Abijah, etc. And then verse 16, Jacob became father to Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So at least according to Matthew, it mattered very much that Solomon married Naamah and bore children through Naamah as his first wife. Because that's how, apparently, the Messiah came to be. Did he not do the most basic of research before he got on camera? It's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed for him. And I can't be the only one who noticed this. But just for the record, there will be some of you saying, oh, yes, but it gives a different lineage in Luke. It does. But doesn't that beg questions all of its own? The fact that there are two different lineages. So if you go to Luke 3, verse 23, it says, When Jesus began his work, he was about 30 years old, being the son, as the opinion was, of Joseph, son of Heli. And then further down, when it gets to verse 31, it says, Son of Melia, son of Mena, son of Matatha, son of Nathan, son of David, son of Jesse continuing into verse 32. So Luke's genealogy doesn't include Solomon. So you could argue, if you really want to, maybe this is the genealogy that David Splane was referring to. But you then have to explain, if you're going to throw Matthew under the bus, <laughs> why does Luke win? You know, what? <laughs> why are there two competing genealogies to begin with and on what basis do we rule out Matthew's genealogy and accept Luke's genealogy and that's before we even get to the point that the entire existence of genealogies in the gospel is irrelevant because apparently Jesus was born of a virgin he was born of Mary and sperm from Joseph played no role in that equation. So why go to all the trouble to give genealogies supporting Joseph's line to begin with if Joseph had no role in Jesus' birth? Well, let's take a moment to think about the women Solomon did marry. Pagan women. Now, you may have relatives who are not in the truth, you love your relatives, and you go visit from time to time. But uh, how long is it before you run out of things to talk about? Because we just don't have the most important thing in common, the truth. So we have to ask, why was Solomon so comfortable with these pagan women? What did he talk about? Well, you can be sure he wasn't studying the watchtower with them. But what was he doing? What was the attraction to these foreign women? Was it their humility? Their modest dress? Their chaste conduct? Their quiet and mild spirit? Or was it mainly the physical? Let's be blunt. Solomon was attracted to the wrong kind of woman. And there may have been early warning signs. Speaking of red flags, when Solomon began marrying many women, uh, did a, a prophet or a priest ever approach him and uh, give him some counsel? Did they ever read the Deuteronomy 17, 17, which applied directly to the king? Deuteronomy 17, 17. It says about the king, Neither should he take many wives for himself, so that his heart may not go astray. Well, if he did receive that counsel, he certainly didn't apply it. And if he didn't receive that counsel, we wonder why not. 
oh, that's easy, because it hadn't been written yet. As I've already explained, Solomon, if he existed, reigned, and this is according to the organization's own literature, between 1037 BCE and 997 BCE, whereas scholars have concluded that Deuteronomy began to be written minimum 250 years after his reign. Don't expect David Splain to know any of this. Don't expect him to give it the slightest thought. He may look and sound like a Bible scholar, but all it takes is for him to open his mouth for an extended period on the subject of the Bible, and it just becomes tragically obvious just how little he knows and understands the book on which he bases his authority, his mandate to run the lives of eight and a half million followers. There's so much to take away from his remarks that we've just been listening to. Let's start off with what he was saying about non-Jehovah's Witness relatives. Now, you may have relatives who are not in the truth, you love your relatives, and you go visit from time to time. But uh, how long is it before you run out of things to talk about? Because we just don't have the most important thing in common, the truth. Thank you for putting it with the finesse and diplomacy of a sledgehammer. This is, in fact, the reality. He's absolutely right. There is an awkwardness when Jehovah's Witnesses go to visit their unbelieving relatives because a Jehovah's Witness thinks mostly about the religion in some form. They do think about other things. They do, for example, follow sport. They follow the news. There are things that they can talk about. They can do small talk with unbelievers. But there's always going to come a point, especially if you take this religion seriously, there's always going to come a point where the conversation runs dry because you don't share in common the most important thing, which is your belief in the organization as God's channel. I just wish they could be this blunt when they're recruiting people into the organization. Would you like to join an organization that will make conversations with your family awkward? We then have this weird bit about Solomon probably not studying the watchtower. Why was Solomon so comfortable with these pagan women? What did he talk about? Well, you can be sure he wasn't studying the watchtower with them. Yeah, we can be sure he wasn't studying the Watchtower with them. Because the Watchtower began to be written in 1879. I think, in fairness, this was intended as a joke. I think he's planned this through in advance. His problem is that it's not a very good joke. Um, if you were going to make that sort of joke, you'd joke about Solomon not reading scrolls or whatever. You wouldn't joke about him <laughs> failing to read from a periodical that began to be published in the 19th century. But his delivery, his comedic timing is just not there at all. He's just reeling it off as though it's in his notes to say this. He's not pausing for any laughter. He's just barreling straight through with what he has to say. I just find him a very, very odd chap. <laughs> and this weird thing about Solomon and not studying the Watchtower, I'm filing that under further evidence to that effect. And then we have David Splain being blunt. Let's be blunt. Solomon was attracted to the wrong kind of woman. And there may have been early warning signs. Oh, warning signs. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. 
Solomon, I'm seeing warning signs that you're attracted to the wrong kind of woman. <laughs> I don't think too much needs to be said on this. It's just manifestly verbal flatulence at this point. It's worth noting, though, that it's highly indicative of the judgmental mindset of Jehovah's Witnesses. There is, in David Splain's words, such thing as the wrong kind of woman in the context of marriage. So right away, if you're watching this as a Jehovah's Witness, you're thinking, oh, I get to think this way about those around me. And if I see a young Jehovah's Witness man in my congregation start to be attracted to someone I don't like, and if I can find some kind of justification via the Bible or via this religion for not liking them, I can label them similarly the wrong kind of woman. That's the sort of judgmentalism that vile speech like this breeds. And quite frankly, if there were such a thing as a David Splain approved right kind of woman, and I were a young single Jehovah's Witness, I wouldn't want to meet her. Today we may be very busy in Jehovah's organization, but we have to be alert to any red flags that despite outward appearances, all is not well with us. A single brother is a regular publisher. He is a regular meeting attender. But on his night, nights off, he likes to go to nightclubs. And he's comfortable in that atmosphere. He isn't shy about striking up conversations with worldly people. And he loves to dance. Well, there are no sisters there, so he dances with worldly women. What's the attraction? He's busy in the congregation, but there's something there that isn't quite right. A young pioneer brother loves to flirt. Several young sisters think he's interested only in them. The attention makes him feel special. A ministerial servant spends a lot of time talking to a married woman. When he's asked about it, he justifies it and says, we're just friends. We're just talking. Famous last words. A fine young sister is offended when an older sister approaches her and points out that her skirts and jeans are too tight, too revealing. Well, all these are red flags. We need to examine ourselves from time to time to see whether, no matter how many privileges we have, something isn't quite right. I don't think something is quite right. In David Splain's head, let's be fair, this is just a train wreck, as you would expect. We get this whenever governing body members get put in front of a camera with a microphone, especially when they're speaking in front of their friends, because this is a morning worship, so he's giving these remarks in the Bethel dining room, surrounded by Bethelites, or staff members at Jehovah's Witness facilities, he's not getting any pushback. You know, when you're going to weigh in on these matters, and you're already kind of lacking in self-awareness, it helps if mentally you know there's some pushback in the minds of those that you're trying to persuade. David Splain's got none of that. It's completely frictionless. He, he can just run his mouth as he sees fit. This is the sort of talk that I used to hear all the time as a Jehovah's Witness in congregation meetings, especially when you used to get visiting elders. So on Sundays, typically in my hall, it will vary depending on the congregation, but Let's say at weekends, there would be a public talk 
and sometimes the public talk would be given by someone from a different congregation, maybe some guy who travelled 30, 40, 50 minutes, maybe even over an hour, just to come to give a talk. And because the culture in our congregation was probably different from the culture in his congregation, inevitably you would get these awkward moments where they would just run their mouths about pet peeves, about personal things that irritated them. And mentally, in my mind, when they started doing this, <laughs> I would be thinking, now he's reading from the Book of Opinions. He's just saying a whole bunch of stuff that isn't in the Bible, and he's making a whole list of rules that are nowhere in Scripture, they're just things that irritate him. Could be stuff that's universally frowned on by Jehovah's Witnesses, but usually it was more to do with the culture in his particular congregation or how things were done in his particular neck of the woods. That's basically what David Splain is doing here. He's giving us four red flags. Red flags, warning signs that someone is a bad apple, <laughs> that someone's a bit dodgy, their bad association, you should look out for them, definitely don't hang around with them or socialise with them because they're on a wrong path and they might influence you negatively. And what are his four, let's call them as they are, pet peeves? his personal grievances that would make a Jehovah's Witness faulty in some way. Let me paraphrase them. Number one, going to nightclubs. That's apparently something that makes someone a bad person. If a ministerial servant were to go to a nightclub, uh, be careful, be careful with that one, especially if he's dancing. And he'll be dancing, let's remember, with, with women who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. You want to watch out there. That, that's a twisted mind. A twisted mind to be doing that sort of thing. So going to nightclubs, flirting with the opposite sex. And this is ambiguous, isn't it? it what counts as flirting? David Splain's opinion on what would constitute flirting might be different from yours or someone else's. It's a subjective thing, isn't it? You could watch two young people in a hall having a laugh with each other and think, oh, that guy's flirting with her. But that's not the intention at all. It's a completely subjective thing. What David Splain is doing here is giving, again, Jehovah's Witnesses license to be judgmental. He's giving his audience the freedom to make conclusions about their fellow worshippers to the extent where they are casting judgment and saying, this is a bad person, this is a red flag, I should hang around with this person less because he is flirting with that girl or she is flirting with that brother. So that's the second one. We've had going to nightclubs. We've had flirting with the opposite sex. Talking to people of the opposite sex who are married too much. That's on his list. So that's the extent to which you need to be paranoid if you are a single Jehovah's Witness and you find yourself having a conversation with someone in your congregation or any other congregation who you know to be married. You know, imagine how paranoid you're going to be listening to this part of David Splain's rant where he's unleashing his personal grievances, you're going to be thinking, you know what? I'm just going to avoid married people. 
you know, I, I don't need the grief and the aggravation of people pointing their fingers at me just because I'm having a conversation with someone I know to be married. I'll just avoid them. It's going to be easier. I, I just want an easy life. I know there's nothing wrong with me speaking to married people, but now it seems there is. Because now it's a red flag. And I don't want any red flags on my person. So that's number three. And number four, taking offence when someone, and again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, taking offence when someone shames you over your clothing. That's also a red flag. It's not a red flag for them to be busybodies and for them to overstep and pry and make it their business to police your apparel, that's totally fine. That's not a red flag. In fact, that's how it should be. <laughs> that's how people should comport themselves when they're Jehovah's Witnesses. They should be going round with, like, Terminator vision. <laughs> and, and it should, you know... But people who are wearing clothing that's a bit too tight, it should be kind of coming up in their JW vision. Too tight, too tight, must admonish. <laughs> admonish, admonish. Um, yeah, that's what's expected. What isn't expected or what isn't appropriate is being offended by that behaviour. So... When the busybody approaches you and says, Lloyd, um, I can see a bit too much of the contours of your buttocks when you're, when you're wearing those particular suit trousers. And if you don't mind me saying, I don't like it. So I'd appreciate it if you don't wear... <laughs> such tight clothing again in the future I've got to just say oh thank you thank you brother busybody for bringing this to my attention I'm deeply appreciative of your wholesome admonition <laughs> and I will be sure to not only get rid of these particular trousers consign them to the rubbish bin but I will also be checking the diameters of my other trousers and <laughs> making sure that my buttocks are not prominent when I'm wearing those <laughs> that's the attitude you need to have same with sisters or ladies who are Jehovah's Witnesses you can't be offended that's a red flag you've got to thank the person who's telling you that your cleavage is showing or that your apparel is of an incorrect level of tightness. You've got to be appreciative. That's the world that Jehovah's Witnesses are living in. Still, let's be fair to David Splain. He may be being super judgmental in these comments, but at least he's not telling us who we should or shouldn't marry. When it comes to choosing a mate, Solomon's example can be instructive to us. Now, what qualities do we value in a marriage mate? Spiritual qualities? Or is it mainly the physical, and we hope that the spiritual will catch up later? A young sister is getting acquainted with a young brother. He's really good-looking, has a great personality, gets along with everybody. But how's he doing spiritually? Does he have a good schedule for theocratic activities, and does he stick to it? For example, if you mention an article in a recent magazine, does he often say, I must have missed that one? If that's what happens, it's a bad sign. Does he make spiritual activities a priority in his life? If he doesn't do that while he's single, what makes you think that he's going to do it after you get married? Will you change him? Or will he change you? As our comment reminds us, 
Solomon enjoyed many privileges, but he apparently felt that some of God's laws just didn't apply to him. Why not? Well, we don't know. Could it be uh, what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes? The king does whatever he wants? Maybe so. Solomon multiplied horses and acquired many wives for himself. So what's the lesson for us? No matter how long we've been in the truth, no matter how many privileges we have, no matter how much Jehovah has used us, we can't afford to let down our guard. We must guard our heart. And we mustn't ignore any red flags that might indicate that all is not well. Thus concludes David Splain's cameo appearance in the November 2022 JW Broadcasting episode, Hypocrisy is a problem. Who'd have thunk it? There's a problem, apparently, with certain Jehovah's Witnesses, especially Jehovah's Witnesses in positions of authority, preaching about righteousness and purporting to play by the rules while simultaneously letting things slip and thinking that certain rules don't apply to them. Am I the only one who, while David Splain was talking, was thinking, Bottlegate? <laughs> he almost perfectly described Anthony Morris, who, let's be completely honest, clearly has an issue when it comes to alcohol, if he doesn't have an issue when it comes to alcohol, there'd better be a damn good reason why he slurs so much in his talks. And with Bottlegate, thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious, we had actual footage of him in a liquor store buying many, many bottles of very expensive Macallan's Scotch whiskey. So... David Splain is trying to point to hypocrisy and in doing so is making a hypocrite of himself or at least of the governing body because that's exactly what the governing body does. They say one thing and they do another. It's the same thing with Stephen Lett when it comes to materialism. He preaches about how terrible materialism is while being a property investor, despite having taken a vow of poverty. Thumbnail here, if Tibor is gracious. So, I was fuming, quite frankly, towards the end there. And that's before we even talk about David Splain lecturing millions of Jehovah's Witnesses on who they should or shouldn't marry. That's what I've just seen. He's laying down rules that are nowhere in the Bible. He's, again, just reading from the book of opinions. These are his ideas. These are his pet peeves. They don't have scriptural basis, or if they do, he hasn't quoted a single scripture when he's listing these off. But as I did previously in his talk... I'm just going to paraphrase them for you. So let's be clear. You're watching this as a young Jehovah's Witness. Let's say you're in your 20s and you're single and you'd really like to get married. Let's say you're a single Jehovah's Witness young woman. And here David Splain is saying that you're not allowed to marry someone who doesn't have or stick to a good schedule for theocratic activities. So maybe you're really attracted to someone who, as David Splain says, has a really nice personality. It's a really sweet, kind person that you're attracted to. But they don't have or stick to a good schedule for theocratic activities. <laughs> like with Britain's Got Talent or America's Got Talent, you just press the button, don't you? It's a big X mark, isn't it? They've failed. It's a red flag. They can no longer be considered 
for a relationship because according to David Splain, this guy's a loser. He's not keeping up with a schedule. Point number two, you're not allowed to consider for dating or marriage someone who can't remember specific Watchtower articles in casual conversation. That's what he described earlier. I mean, that's a tough one. <laughs> Surely that would apply to practically every Jehovah's Witness male. I mean, even elders. You know, if you approached me when I was an elder for a year, it was a year that I spent as an elder, if you'd approached me and said, what did you think about the main gist of the February 2007, February 15th, 2007 Watchtower, particularly those paragraphs towards the end? What did you think of that, Lloyd? <laughs> I would have been like, <laughs> there's no way. There's no way you remember Watchtower articles like that. He's setting a bar that I'm sure even he can't reach because he's shown in this talk that even his grasp of Bible knowledge is a bit dodgy. He, he gave that remark earlier about Solomon and about how it would have positively affected the history of Israel if Solomon hadn't had a pagan wife through which he had a son Rehoboam. He said that that would have been a positive thing, even though in Matthew it lists Rehoboam as an ancestor of Joseph and part of the proof of the Messiah. So this is a man who doesn't even know his Bible that well. And he's setting as a mark, as a potential red flag not being able to identify Watchtower articles in casual conversation. I think even he would fail there as a governing body member, especially given his poor knowledge of the Bible. So, I don't know what to say. It's just getting harder and harder, isn't it, to be a Jehovah's Witness? It's hard enough following the rules that at least have some kind of scriptural backing. But when you layer on these extra rules so that now you shouldn't consider for marriage someone who fails to remember specific Watchtower articles, it's just getting impossible, isn't it? And, <laughs> and the third one fails to prioritize spiritual activities. So if there's a spiritual activity that you could be doing and something that isn't spiritual, let's say a game of football, let's say your favorite team is playing and you could be preparing for the watchtower. If you prioritize the game of football, which is only going to happen that one time, <laughs> it's literally not going to happen again. That's the time when the football happens. The watchtower preparation can be done at any point during the week up to when the watchtower study is. But do you understand what I'm saying? You need to prioritize the spiritual activity. Could be studying the watchtower, could be doing some other kind of meeting preparation or Bible study or family worship. You need to be able to prioritize spiritual activities over non-spiritual activities. And if you don't, it's a red flag. It's that red X. Am I the only one, viewers? Or is this taking things up a notch? It feels as though David Splain's ridiculous rant, this unhinged list of rules that he's giving... It feels like he's making the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses even harder, even more impossible than they already were. And that's saying something. <laughs> because being a Jehovah's Witness is no walk in the park. 
and especially when we come to rules on marriage and relationships and sex, especially when it starts becoming sexual repression and people who would be in healthy relationships end up being talked out of them on such trivial grounds, on such a trivial basis as, ah, yes, but he didn't know that Watchtower article. What does it say about this organisation and how hopelessly authoritarian it has become? Our bonds of love became even more evident in 1919 at Cedar Point, Ohio. This was the first major convention held after Brother Rutherford and his associates had been released from prison. Thrilled to finally gather together safely, the Bible students just kept coming and coming until the entire program had to be moved outdoors, with some 7,000 in attendance. Just three years later, in 1922, Cedar Point was the location of an even more exciting convention with an average daily attendance of about 10,000. It energized God's people to go on preaching with renewed vigor. Many conventions in the years that followed helped unite God's people in even more powerful ways, like the unforgettable one held in Columbus, Ohio in 1931. Actually, it's Columbus, Ohio, it says so on the photograph. From Poland to Korea, from Australia to South Africa, conventions were, and still are, joyful spiritual occasions for all of God's people. They motivate and encourage us, unite us as brothers and sisters, and most importantly, draw us closer to Jehovah. We've just been watching about a minute and a half of a segment from the November 2022 JW Broadcasting episode. This is the latest installment in the series Our History in Motion, a series that you might say reimagines the history of the organization, certainly whitewashes it, and I've given some pretty good examples of where they've done that in previous episodes. This particular episode, frankly, I just found quite dull, <laughs> which is why I've only shown you a minute and a half. Towards the end there, what I did find interesting, and maybe Tibor can overlay if he's feeling gracious, it's interesting that you're seeing these images moving past and interspersed in these images are images of the governing body brandishing Bibles or new releases. Isn't it interesting that even in a segment like this that's supposed to be educating Jehovah's Witnesses on their history, the modern day governing body need to be front center. We need to remind the followers what we look like. We need to be there in some way. Maybe they didn't individually insist on having their footage shown. More likely, it's just someone in the audiovisual department who's edited this together. But that's the culture, isn't it, of the Jehovah's Witness organization? Increasingly so. This notion that the governing body, not only are they God's channel, but we need to be reminded on a constant basis what they have to say and what they look like. They always used to be in the shadows when I was a Jehovah's Witness. And frankly, I respected them more as a result. <laughs> it was easier to respect and admire them and view them as wise when you couldn't see them, you never heard from them. You just occasionally might see a photograph in a watchtower or there was a page in the proclaimers history book showing their images on one page and you could admire and respect them because you didn't know what they sounded like individually and it was 
kind of mysterious. But now everything's just out there. And not only is it obvious that they're not wise or knowledgeable, in some cases they're frankly clownish and laughable, not only is it obvious that they're entirely unworthy of respect and admiration, it's also obvious that they can't get enough of themselves. That, quite frankly, this organisation is descending into what would be classed, or could be classed, as idolatry. That's how I would have seen things if this had just been hurled at me 20 years ago, when I was a believing, a young believing Jehovah's Witness, I'd be thinking, that's not the religion that I know. That's televangelism. It's televangelism when you have preachers making it all about them. So that was one thing I wanted to comment on. The other thing, I'm never going to resist an opportunity <laughs> to talk about the 1922 Cedar Point, Ohio Convention, because some of you will know that when I first started doing activism, it wasn't under my real name, which is Lloyd Evans, which is the name of this channel. I started doing my activism under a pseudonym, which was John Cedars. And the name Cedars, I'm not going to bore you with the whole story, but it was connected to the Cedar Point, Ohio Convention of 1922, and particularly this photograph. If Tibor can show it on the screen, he would be exceedingly gracious. So there's this photograph, which Jehovah's Witnesses know quite well. And because it's in black and white, or sepia, you don't notice that either side of the stage there are American flags hanging from the, I guess you'd call them pillars of the venue. That would be not just questionable if it happened now, it would be, well, the, the flags would be torn down. You do occasionally still get flags when Jehovah's Witnesses meet at convention venues, perhaps because it's part of the decor of the venue. But here they're kind of very prominent, either side of the stage. And surely, you know, the Bible students wouldn't have been forced to have such a landmark convention in a place with flags that were so prominent, if they didn't want that. And this indicates that the organisation back then was completely different, had a completely different attitude towards nationalism. So you have these prominent flags either side of the stage at this early landmark Jehovah's Witness convention and let me now show you some footage from the Faith in Action Part 1 video. This was released a number of years before JW Broadcasting. But notice how they doctored their reenactment of this famous landmark convention. On September 8, 1922, another convention was held at Cedar Point. Here... Rutherford gave what would become perhaps his most memorable speech. Do you believe that the King of Glory has begun his reign? Yes! Then back to the field. The world must know that Jehovah is God and that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the day of all days. Behold, the king reigns. You are his publicity agents. Therefore, advertise, advertise, advertise the king and his kingdom. No flags. The flags have gone. Even though they have the opportunity, if they were being 
honest and they were being accurate, if they were depicting this event accurately, the flags would need to be there. It wasn't in their interests, though, was it, to show the flags? Because that would have raised questions. Better to have them in the distance, in the sepia photograph, and when you're reenacting this landmark convention, this advertise, advertise, advertise convention, better to rearrange it so the flags aren't there. And this actually was one of the things that when I found it, I found out about it early on in my kind of awakening process, it really enraged me because it was just, well, it was just so obviously sneaky and dishonest and disingenuous regarding the past of what was supposed to be God's organization. If it's God's organization, this sort of thing should not be happening. You shouldn't have history being whitewashed and history being told inaccurately. But you also shouldn't have the convention taking place in a venue that was bedecked in American flags to begin with. If 1919 was supposedly the year that the faithful slave was chosen and this convention was taking place just three years later in 1922. So I did just want to raise that point. It won't be interesting to everyone. Everyone has their own sort of line of interest, I've noticed, when it comes to things that irritate them or kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back when it comes to discovering that they've been lied to or that the organisation isn't what it purports to be. And just because I found this point problematic doesn't mean everyone will, doesn't mean all Jehovah's Witnesses will. But given an opportunity to talk about it with this latest instalment of Our History in Motion, don't mind if I do. Please enjoy the music video, Friends Again. Hold on a minute. Let's go back. What's this guy looking at in his car? He's, he's pulling up a picture of a crucified Jesus. And if we can overlay it, Tibor, you'd be very gracious if you could do that. He's expanding the image so that he can get a good look at Jesus's torso and the wounds from all of that scourging what a weird chap <laughs> so anyway I, I think the point here if I had to guess is 
this guy has had a disagreement with a fellow Jehovah's Witness. That's what the song's about. Friends again. Welcome to the latest original song in a JW Broadcasting episode. It's another cringeworthy music video. And this time, these two Jehovah's Witnesses have had a falling out. And the song is about them being friends again and learning to look past their differences and fix things, which is apparently something you can only do, as we all know, <laughs> when you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. People who become friends who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses, what happens is they fall out and they never, ever get back together. That's how things work, unfortunately, <laughs> outside of the organisation. Whereas... Inside the organization, it's different. And friends can forgive each other and sort out their differences and everything can be swell again. And apparently a key way of doing this is for you to sit in your car or in your private place, <laughs> wherever that might, might be, somewhere where you can get away from it all, get a bit of peace and quiet, just allow yourself to unwind a little bit. Just breathe, relax, think relaxing thoughts. Pull up a Watchtower article that's reminding you that God made a huge sacrifice for your sins because he allowed his son to be scourged and crucified and killed in a gruesome way. So if God could forgive you in such a profound way, why can't you forgive your friend if there's been some kind of falling out? And actually, while you're studying the article, just to make the point stick more in your mind, use the feature on your tablet to just enlarge that image and just think a bit about those wounds. <laughs> Just think a bit about the torture that Jesus went through. And that's going to make it possible for you to patch things up with your friend. Otherwise, as with all non-Jehovah's Witness friendships that break apart, your friendship is doomed. For this month's video postcard, we travel to Guatemala in Central America. What aspects of Jehovah's creation do you enjoy? Jungles? Beaches, mountains, rainforest. Guatemala has them all. It even has volcanoes, lots of volcanoes. Southern Guatemala has a string of 27. We're right at the end of the November 2022 JW Broadcasting episode. It's time for the video postcard. Yes, every episode of JW Broadcasting nowadays ends with a video postcard from some part of the world and it focuses on the work of Jehovah's Witnesses, usually the preaching and recruitment work that Jehovah's Witnesses do in that particular part. And I usually skip these because they're usually quite tedious. It's kind of interesting how they start off each postcard by giving facts <laughs> about the country that anyone can just pull up on Wikipedia. And I just think that whoever's written William Turner's script here has just been a bit lazy and inadvertently given Jehovah's Witnesses, I hope, some food for thought. So Guatemala has, as its most prominent features, some acts of creation. So William Turner says, What aspects of Jehovah's creation do you enjoy? What aspects of Jehovah's creation do you enjoy? And then he lists jungles, hmm. <laughs> beaches, mountains, and rainforests, and then volcanoes. <laughs> so we're admitting at this point that volcanoes were an intentional and deliberate act of creation. So 
God who created our planet for human habitation created our planet with those spikes of boiling lava. <laughs> Can you imagine how that would have played out? So imagine, you know, the angels are giving a report to God on their progress with Guatemala. So angels, I need to know what the latest is on Central America. I hope that you've been making some progress with the notes I gave you. Yes, Lord, we've been making excellent progress. The part of Central America that the humans will later call Guatemala is coming on especially nicely. Oh, really? Did you include those jungles I asked for? Yes, the jungles are just brilliant. You are going to love what we've done with the jungles. Excellent. What about the beaches? The beaches. Oh, the beaches. The beaches, Lord, if you'll excuse the pun, are divine. Mm, very nice. And the mountains? I don't like to brag because we angels, as you know, Lord, we don't do bragging. But boy, have we made you some spectacular mountains. You are just going to die. I'm sorry, Lord, you're not going to die, but you are going to love our mountains. Okay, and the rainforests? I was hoping you'd ask about the rainforests. Our rainforests are so spectacular. They're really lush. You know those rainforests you get sometimes, made by other angels, who they make their rainforests a bit too threadbare. Our rainforests are so lush and so... They're thick and they're green. You're going to really love them. Okay, sounds like you've been following my notes. So I assume you've made me some nice volcanoes. About the volcanoes, we did notice them on your memo, Lord, but we had a bit of a brainstorm and we thought maybe, hear me out, maybe the volcanoes with the spewing lava and the burning hot ash, maybe they might not work so well in an environment where there are humans living. We're just thinking, you know how humans, they tend to die easily. Um, we just thought maybe having the volcanoes and the humans in close proximity might lead to some humans, you know, burning. Well, that's their fault. If they want to live near a volcano or in the vicinity of one of my beautiful volcanoes, that's on them if they die. Of course, what were we thinking? I'm so sorry, Lord. I did try to tell them, if you don't mind me saying, but would they listen? No, they just carried on with their brainstorming. We will include the volcanoes, I promise you. I take accountability. I apologize for everyone on the Central America Project. We will make sure Guatemala has volcanoes. How many were you thinking? 27. Anyway, thus concludes my review of the November 2022 JW broadcasting episode. I hope you found my thoughts interesting. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.